Hey there, my name is Alex. I am the Silvermont, and this is the second part of my PvP guide for Final Fantasy XIV. The first part covered the modes and general outline of PvP, whereas this one is more focused on the individual jobs, as of Endwalker. So if you're watching this after, I don't know, Start Sprinter came out, I'm sorry, I won't be covering the new jobs featured in that. Yellow Mage and Captain Caveman. Do check out the first part if you've not seen it, and are new to 14's PvP though. Likewise, I have a bunch of other 14 guides on the channel too. That out of the way, feel free to jump to a timecode on screen or in the seek bar or in the description if you're after a specific job. Otherwise, let's get started. Paladin, as with all the other tanks, has a 60% defense boost. In other words, they take 60% less damage, as do melee DPS. The Paladin has 60,000 health, and perhaps has the most team support out of all the tanks. Personal damage is low, but Shield Bash is a powerful, on-demand stun to help lock down a target. Guardian effectively works like cover from PvE, allowing you to take damage intended for the target member you used Guardian on. Perfect if you need to protect a squishy friend. Paladin's limit break is Phalanx, which grants you Hallowed Ground, aka Invincible, and nearby party members a 50% damage taken reduction. There aren't many defenses superior to becoming outright invincible, but in practical terms, it actually has limited uses in PvP, as most players will just ignore you, and there's not all that much you can do whilst invincible whilst being ignored but it's still nice to have. Paladin is currently a bit weak in front lines, far more useful in Crystal Conflict. Warrior has 63,000 health, the most of any job. This, combined with their passive 60% defense boost and very powerful self-healing and self-sustain from blood wetting makes them very durable. On top of great sustain, warriors have a long range, jumping AoE stun attack, which is a perfect engagement tool. One reason warriors have more health is because certain abilities will consume it. However, it's easy to keep that under control with blood wetting. The warrior's limit break, Primal Scream, is one of the most powerful tools in PvP, because any enemy hit by it is rendered unable to use guard for 15 seconds. It is the only tool which can outright disable guard functionality, as opposed to penetrating it. It's an AoE ability by the way too. It also increases the warrior's stats, also makes them resistant and immune to certain crowd control abilities. Overall, warrior is a great pick in just about any PvP mode. As of patch 6.3, Dark Knight is what you might consider the meta tank, that is to say, one of the most effective tanks. The Dark Knight has 60,000 health, which is, in classic Dark Knight fashion, drained by certain abilities. But what makes them so strong? Their setup and burst potential. Salted Earth draws in all nearby enemies and then allows you to bind them in place with Salt and Darkness as its follow up. Combine this with Dragoon's Limit Break, for example, and you have True Agony. The Dark Knight also has the Blackest Knight, which is just as good in PvP as PvE. A strong, on-demand shield, which also boosts your offense when the shield is consumed. The Dark Knight's Limit Break is even tied, consuming all of the Dark Knight's health to increase damage, so if you use it at full health, it'll be 24,000 potency behind you and in front of you, with 6,000 base potency. Whilst it reduces you to one hit point, it makes every single weapon skill you land heal you, and for 10 seconds after using Eventide, you can't be killed by almost every attack. Combine this with the fact that standing in Salted Earth heals you over time and increases your defense, and Quietus is an AoE weapon skill that heals for the damage it inflicts, Dark Knight has serious sustain and AoE potential. If you get dragged into Salted Earth, you might be wise to guard immediately as the violence is about to escalate. A good counter for Dark Knights is anything that relocates them, dislocates them indeed. If you can knock them out of their red circle, that's going to help you a little bit. 
Needless to say, Dark Knight rather dominates in front lines, and is also very powerful in Crystal Conflict. Gunbreaker is an interesting one. Whilst it has 60,000 health and the same defense boost as the other melee jobs, it leans almost more towards a damage dealer melee than a tank. The unique aspects are junction. Junctioning a DPS target will turn the ability into Blasting Zone, a strong single target attack. Junctioning healers turns it into Aurora, a fairly powerful single target heal that can be used on the Gunbreaker or a party member. Whereas junctioning a tank target turns it into Nebula, a 20% defense boost which also retaliates with a 4000 potency attack every time you suffer damage. Arguably the best one, but only if people are actively hitting you. Needless to say, might be better in frontline than in Crystal Conflict where there's more people who might unintentionally be smacking you. Gunbreaker's limit break is unfortunately not great. It unleashes a series of attacks whilst increasing your defense, but unfortunately, as it's a channeled ability, you can be interrupted very easily during its duration and stunned out of it, for example. It does also inflict a stacking debuff on enemies, increasing their damage taken, so whilst it can potentially be pretty strong, especially with the final hit being a stun with higher damage, the lack of any resistance to crowd control during makes it too easy to counter. That said, Gunbreaker isn't as bad as some people think. It does require a bit more thought and nuance, and in most cases, arguably another job would be a superior pick though. White Mage has 51,000 health, takes 30% less damage, and deals 10% less damage. However, as you might expect of White Mage, it has some of the most powerful healing tools on demand. Cure has two charges, and you can also get an instant cast Cure after using your Gap Closer ability. Aqua Veil is a barrier spell which doubles in potency when used to remove a status affliction, making it extremely powerful as a tool in Crystal Conflict in particular. Even more powerful is Miracle of Nature, a unique polymorph which turns enemies into a blob for two seconds, rendering them helpless. They can't heal, they can't guard, they can't attack. All they can do is move and suffer. The White Mage's Limit Break is a very long range line AoE stun, which is freakishly wide. It also increases damage dealt and healing potency by 10%, and puts a regen on nearby team members as a bonus. Needless to say, White Mage is amazing for all modes. Generally speaking, Miracle of Nature's Polymorph is best used to either lock down a powerful opponent, or it's best use, in my opinion, to help secure a kill on a low health player. If your team is focusing someone, once they get below 50%, hit them with a Miracle of Nature, and they won't be able to move, heal, escape, guard, they'll just melt, hopefully. Scholar shares the minus 10% damage dealt penalty with White Mage, but has less health at 49,500. It also spreads diseases in a worrying manner. The whole gimmick with Scholar is spread. Deployment Tactics is an ability that spreads either your shields on friendly targets or your powerful debuffs on enemies. Biolysis is a strong damage over time, which also causes the target to deal less damage. It can be made even stronger with Recitation, a unique buff which enhances your shields or your dots, gained by Expedient, a group speed and defense boost, and also by using the Scholar's Limit Break, Summon Seraph, as well as giving you a charge of your enhanced shield or dot, summoning the Seraph will heal party members, give them shields, and using the Limit Break again will cast Seraphic Flight which puts excogitation on party members, healing them automatically when they reach a certain amount of health, whilst also nullifying certain status ailments. Scholar might not have any burst damage, but they can push out millions of damage in front lines from spreading their dots around. While Scholar is by no means useless in Crystal Conflict, I would say White Mage and Sage and Astrologian are usually a little bit better. Scholar is a lot of fun in front lines though. As the first healer without a damage penalty, Astrologian has only 49,500 health, the same as Scholar. 
it tends to be the healer you see the least of, from my experience. Double cast is its unique gimmick, allowing you to repeat your last spell. This means you can effectively have four charges of on-demand healing, two of which would be instant cast to boot. Aside from the heals, Astrologian can use their cards to bolster party members, and their limit break, Celestial River, reduces enemy damage by 30% but diminishes over its duration, whilst also increasing damage dealt by the Astrologian and nearby party members. Of course, this is virtually useless if your team aren't standing within the vicinity. Same goes for the cards, which can be a nuisance in frontline that probably won't be as big of an issue in CC. Astrologian, or Astrologian, however you like to call it, also has the useful macro ability, which allows you to heal nearby party members whilst reducing damage. This ability is perfect to use when you anticipate a lot of incoming damage, such as when a Dark Knight jumps over and starts drawing everyone in. No doubt with a Dragoon floating above, ready to limit break. Sage is as much a healer as Gunbreaker is a tank, you're basically here to shoot people with lasers. 48,000 health makes you the squishiest job in the game, along with Black Mage. However, the Sage has a lot of powerful tools. Numa, for example, deals hefty damage, but also gives you and party members nearby a powerful barrier that stacks five times, healing for an amount determined by the number of shield stacks left at the end of the duration. The Sage can also dash to either enemy or friend, which is a very useful ability both for offense and defense. Cardia can be tricky to get right. It's nice to put on a target taking damage, such as a tank, but don't be afraid to put it on yourself, or anyone, to reap the benefits. I would say keep it on yourself unless you see a tank who is nearby. <laughs> the Sage's Limit Break is an amazing tool. It puts down a magical circle. When you or your teammates are standing inside this circle, you're going to avoid almost all damage from enemies who aren't in the circle. If they are not in the circle, they can't really hurt you much. However, if enemies do go inside the circle, they will take a powerful damage over time ability while standing there. Tools like this, which control the battlefield, forcing your enemy to adapt to it, can't be overstated how useful they are. You can even change where you put it once after casting it. Because of this and other things, Sage is great in both Crystal Conflict and Frontlines. They're amazing at anything that needs an objective. The Monk has 60,000 health and 60% bonus defense as with all melee, and it specializes in long combos, ending with an extremely powerful Phantom Rush. The problem is that uh, situations wherein you're allowed the time you need to build up that high combo can be few and far between, especially in frontline. The Monk is a sturdy frontline fighter though, Riddle of Earth, allowing you to compile damage over a duration, then unleash a portion of it back. But it is easily countered by just not attacking the Monk when they have that up. The Monk has a strong knockback ability, and your next weapon skill or limit break on a knocked back target will deal extra damage. Speaking of limit breaks, Meteor Drive is I believe the longest crowd control in the game. The Monk pile drives the target, either removing guard or dealing extra damage if they weren't guarding. It stuns them for 3 seconds. This is perfect for singling out a target, either to remove them from play for a few seconds or for your allies to focus them down. Whilst the Monk can be pretty useful, I'd say they're generally better in Crystal Conflict. And even then, you need to rely on your team coordinating with you, as the animation lock of your limit break can leave you extremely vulnerable, and you don't want to die. Fifty-eight thousand five hundred hit points and sixty percent defense has the Dragoon, and it is probably the best one v one or dueling class in the game. In that, if you one v one a Dragoon with any other job, the Dragoon is liable to be the victor thanks to the skill Horrid Roar. All nearby enemies marked by the Roar deal fifty percent less damage to the Dragoon for ten seconds. Of course, this doesn't mean Dragoon is the best job, even if it's generally able to win duels against anyone else. However, they are really damn good, and I would say right now, the best general use melee. 
elusive jump provides them with a handy escape and can be followed up with a strong ranged option. And you can use it to hunt someone down too if you want to backflip over to them, but it's probably better to use it as an escape. They can jump to close the gap. Chaotic Spring gives them a little extra self-sustain, and their burst potential with Nastrond is high. Finally, the Dragoon's Limit Break is a true jump, allowing them to escape binds and leave the battlefield momentarily as they choose where to land, dealing huge damage to the center and slightly less further out. On top of that, it also creates a barrier, allowing you to dive into enemy teams and then hopefully escape. People will often guard if they see you coming for them with the Limit Break, but this can be taken into account. Being able to fairly reliably force enemies into guarding is a useful tool in on itself. Dark Knights and Dragoons make a fearsome AoE burst duo when coordinated. Dragoon is honestly great in all PvP modes. Whilst Ninja may have the least health of all the melee classes at 57,000, attempting to pin one down and finish them off can be a nightmare, considering they have a teleport which breaks target lock and grants stealth, two barriers and a heal, along with recuperate and guard, of course. Ninja has multiple ranged options and Mudras allow them to select the best tool for the situation, a shield, a self-heal, two AoEs, a heart-hitting ranged attack, and a stun that follows up with another stun. Oh right, if that wasn't enough, you can also defense shred enemies, and the limit break is an instant kill on anyone who has less than 50% health. And you can chain it, so if you kill a target with the limit break, or within 4 seconds of hitting them with it, you can cast it again, for free. Meaning, there are times I've managed to chain it 5 or 6 times, just bouncing around, killing person after person maxing out battle high incredibly quickly. Ninja is absurdly versatile and useful. Even if Dragoons and Monks often push out somewhat more damage, the safety and flexibility makes Ninja a top pick in any PvP mode. Fifty-eight thousand five hundred health, high damage, and instant kill capabilities make the Samurai a target to watch out for. Dashes, stuns, and high-hitting charge slashes are all well and good, but the one thing that makes Samurai stand out is Zantetsuken. After using the Shiten buff, the Samurai will gain extra defense and debuff anyone who strikes them during the 5 seconds Shiten is up. That target will take more damage from the Samurai, and if you use Limit Break on them, they will instantly be killed. Zantetsuken is also an area of effect ability, meaning you can insta-kill several people, especially in frontline where they might AoE you without realising it, or you can start capturing the objective while Shiten is up and kind of semi-force people into smacking you. Popular strategies involve using Meikyo right before Shiten, or using Guard to inflict the debuff from relative safety, then using Zantetsuken to cancel Guard or when it ends by itself. Of course, if you see a samurai using Shiten, it might be wise not to hit them, but this can be also used defensively by the samurai for mind games when escaping or baiting enemies, so you'll need to potentially take a gamble. Then again, if you have any crowd control or silences and stuff like that, you can always try and stun the samurai as his window of opportunity for Zantetsuken insta-kills is limited indeed. Incidentally, even ignoring the insta-kill capabilities, Zantetsuken is still a very fast, long-range AoE attack with a potency of 24,000. So don't be afraid to use it even without the debuff, instant-kill stuff. The Samurai's contributions can end up revolving on how ignorant the enemy team are in regards to dealing with Shiten. I am Bolo Santosi, leader of the Reapers and Reaper is kinda boring. That's just my opinion, I'm sorry. The whole thing with Reaper is you build stacks to make some of your attacks stronger, you have a self barrier, and your limit break is pretty useful as it forces people to run in terror. You have the ability to reposition using your hell portal things, but um, I'll be honest, I don't really have much to say about Reaper. It's there, it's not terrible, it's not great, it just exists. Fifty-one thousand health and only thirty percent defense boosts make Bard pretty squishy, especially when you take into account that they only really have one way to do any sort of escape, with a backstep that binds the target. That said, the Bard 
is a useful and versatile job. And as much as I cannot stand the fusion of harp and bow for Bard, that's another matter entirely. But in PvP, Bard is actually one of my favourite jobs. I love ranger archetypes and Bard is kind of close to that in PvP. But yes, it's useful and versatile. Aside from various damage abilities, the main of which deals higher damage from optimal long range, Bard has the incredible ability to silence. This not only stops people from using abilities, but it stops them from healing and purifying too. The uses for this are legion. You can use it on a dark knight that has plunged into your team. You can use it on a healer to stop them supporting their allies. You can use it on a samurai to shut down Zantetsuken. Or you can simply use it to finish off a low health or a focused target by making sure they can't heal themselves or escape whilst your team collectively throttles them. The Bard's Imperial Arrow has three charges, with each charge being expended simultaneously, allowing you to have an off-global cooldown up to 12,000 potency instant ranged attack, which is really nice for bursting and finishing people off, especially if they're silenced, for example. Bard's Limit Break is Final Fantasia. After all these years, you can finally become Final Fantasy Endwalker. It boosts the Bard's attack and movement speed, whilst also giving nearby allies 10% damage boost and filling their limit break gauges. That, combined with the silence and purification aspects Bard provides, makes it a very solid pick in both frontline and crystal conflict. The Machinist has 52,500 health, and if I had to describe the job, it wouldn't be Machinist, it would be Mage Killer. The Machinist's unique gimmick is Analysis, which buffs your rotating skills. Drill gets buffed 20,000 potency. Bioblaster applies a heavy effect. Air Anger hits harder and stuns. Chainsaw gains a 3% chance to effectively insta-kill whoever it hits. But if you combine an upgraded Drill with the Machinist's Limit Break, Marksman Spite, that's a combined 56,000 potency, which is generally enough to dispatch Summoner, White Mage, and Scholar, and deal critical damage to any non-melee. Beyond this, the Machinist has a useful knockback ability, great for those pesky Dark Knights, and a turret, which is perfect for zone control. Place it on the objective in frontline, or the crystal in conflict, as it'll zap enemies and drop barriers onto allies. However, the Machinist has absolutely no defense beyond slows and stuns, meaning if you get caught in melee range, you have little to rely on other than your common actions, your teammates, and hope. But that said, Machinist is pretty handy in front lines in CC. In CC, you might get unlucky and come up against a team of mostly melees, in which case your burst combo of draw and limit break is a lot less debilitating. It's still good, but if you come up against a team with a lot of squishies, Machinist can really shine. The Dancer has 54,000 health, and just like in PvE, you'll want to pick a dance partner who will receive various benefits from your abilities as you use them. Just who you wish to partner with is up to you, but a melee damage dealer is often a good bet from my experience. The Dancer's dashes aren't just movement options, they'll unlock your harder hitting abilities, such as Saber Dance, which has 10,000 AoE potency, or 15,000 when used on a single target. The Dancer's Limit Break, Contra Dance, is a powerful AoE stun, but it's worth pointing out that it can be tricky to make the most out of this Limit Break, as you're vulnerable after casting it. But if you hit a Limit Break charmed enemy, you'll be able to extend the duration of their dance from 2 seconds to 4. Unfortunately, I've rarely found instances when dancers were an optimal pick. It isn't that they are bad per se, but other jobs can often bring to the table more even if dancers do have a rather unique AoE heal. You can certainly make a dancer work, as you can make anything work, but they wouldn't be what I would consider a top pick, in most cases. The Black Mage's 48,000 health contributes, but isn't the sole reason for it being one of the hardest jobs, in my opinion, to play in PvP, as well as PvE. That said, it's incredibly fun, like PvE, you will retain Umbral Ice, Astral Fire, 
unlike PvE, they do the same amount of damage now. Each one will build stacks on enemies. Once you hit them with Super Flare, it'll not only do more damage based on the stacks, but also slow, bind, or freeze enemies with ice, or deal an increasingly powerful damage over time with fire. Which to use? Well, ice is arguably more useful in smaller scale battles, but the damage over time from fire is not to be scoffed at, especially when you can apply it to a large number of enemies at once. Generally speaking, I'd say if you're fighting four or five enemies, use ice. If you're fighting more than five, put fire on. Beyond this, the Black Mage can teleport to enemies or allies, which grants Swift Cast. Burst allows them to strike nearby enemies with lightning, generating a barrier around the Black Mage in the process. So, a popular thing to do, you would think, might be to teleport to an enemy with Swift Cast and then Swift Cast a burst onto them. A sleep ability provides the Black Mage some crowd control and survivability. Limit Break, Soul Resonance, upgrades Fire to Flare and Blizzard to Freeze, making them stronger AoE variants. It also gives you a tick of Foul to hit people with a strong AoE. Considering the relatively short range and squishiness, however, the Black Mage needs to be very careful, as they can be burst down in the blink of an eye. They are so squishy. Summoners have 49,500 health and fond memories of the pre-nerf era of Bahamut, when dozens of the Elder Primals rained down death and destruction and misery upon front lines. As for now, well, summoners still have a lot of useful AoE and general utility. Channeling Ifrit, they can charge a foe and follow up by bonking them on the head with a hammer. For Garuda, they lay down a donut of wind agony, which reminds me how hungry I am. I could go for a donut. It's great for objectives. For Titan, clap someone with some rocks to bind them in place. The summoner also has a defensive shield that can be put on themselves or allies, and their limit breaks are still powerful. Summoning Phoenix will grant a small heal to allies and a buff that grants them a large heal automatically if they go below a quarter health. Whereas summoning Bahamut, Bahamut, Bahamut will just do an 18,000 potency attack in a huge area. Both summons will linger, dealing damage by themselves and enhancing your bread and butter spell. Bahama increasing the potency, Phoenix likewise, but also adding a damage over time capacity to it. Summoners are perfect in frontline, far from useless in CC, but they don't shine as much there. They're still good though. Red Mage's 51,000 health is a sign of their more melee focused playstyle than the other casters. As with PvE, you have black and white mana, though this time it's more like modes you shift between. During white shift, your abilities will take on generally more defensive enhancements, whereas black shift will be more offensive enhancements. Considering the weapon skills typically do need you to be in melee range, Red Mage can quickly take a lot of damage, especially in front lines. However, their limit break, Southern Cross, is a powerful damage and healing spell that hits in a plus sign. Anyone standing on the middle of the area will be hit twice, either by the heal or the damage. In Black Shift, that can be up to 24,000 potency, which is not to be scoffed at for an AoE. I would say Red Mage shines a little more in CC, where their ability to adapt to situations on the fly makes them more valuable than in front lines, where the melee part of their kit can lead them into danger and suffering. That about does it though. That's every job for now that you can play in 14. No Blue Mage, as entertaining as that would be in PvP. I hope this guide was useful, or just entertaining, or whatever, but uh, my voice is more or less shot after 40 minutes of recording, so thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Ciao!